participants of the dialogue, International Dialogue on Migration, we would like to start uh, this afternoon session with an exciting panel which we have worked very hard to put together for all of you uh, and prepared a very exciting uh, panel of speakers. Um, I'm going to introduce them in a bit, uh, but before doing that, let me say a few words uh, about the one and a half hours that we are going to spend together with you uh, uh, right now, starting to discuss uh, the topic of empowering migrants and transnational communities as development actors in terms of financial inclusions, remittances and beyond. Um, this topic has been already discussed and mentioned in the previous panels of this uh, dialogue. Uh, in today's morning session, I know that the representatives of diaspora we're already referring uh, it, it to, towards the, the content which we are going to discuss now. So it's a natural continuation of, of the previous panels as well as the ones uh, during yesterday. So um, a few words about what we want to, to do today in, the, in this one and a half hours that we have to, 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 together with you. So we would like to really look into the topic of remittances uh, and uh, si the uh, situation with migrant workers, migrants and diaspora communities, zooming into the overarching topic of this dialogue during the COVID period, the pandemic, how it influenced the situation of migrants, but also in terms of uh, expanding we certainly would like not to stop there and discuss on the latest trends of remittances and the impacts, but also start looking into the broader notion of migrant contributions to development. Uh, as you know, uh, we have, uh, you might have noticed the, the launch of a very interesting publication that we put together, uh, Contributions and Counting. And for us, this, uh, the, the areas of migrants and impact on, on their, uh, on their situation during COVID, but also the situation of families and communities. Uh, this is spamming beyond just the, the, the topic of remittances and financial transfers, because we see migrants as agents uh, in, in involving in the other areas and other forms of engagement with the communities, both where they reside, but also communities of origin. So we will also discuss today uh, the broader notion of contributions of migrants as uh, envisaged in objective 19 of the global compact and uh, such areas as investments where diaspora is bringing their resources to support economic development, philanthropy, trade. And in addition to that, we also will zoom into the issues of uh, the role of governments uh, in the context of supporting migrants and transnational communities. Uh, as we gear towards the uh, International Migration Forum review scheduled uh, for the first part of the next oh, year, uh, we will be, of course, looking into the topic of migrants' contributions. I think we need to look into this sound, parallel sound, but just to, to revert further. So as we move to the GCM implementation and reporting on the progress within GCM, it will be absolutely crucial for us not to forget indeed this topic of uh, remittances, migrants, contributions, which are covered by objectives 19 and 20. So moving forward, we will also look into the and discuss the role of governments and how they can support migrants to become agents of development in a more powerful manner. So let me say a few words about the panelists uh, who we invited to spend this time with us during this panel. Uh, first of all, um, we have uh, Ms. Veronika uh, Stadsgaard, um, the founder and CEO at, uh, of the International Association of Money Transfer Networks. Uh, Veronica is, uh, uh, is our uh, trustworthy partner with whom we have been engaging in a number of initiatives. She is passionate about innovation and fintech, um, and especially with the focus on enabling access to financial services for the world. She has over 16 years of experience in the remittance industry. 
Since founding the association, Veronica has been working with different stakeholders to bridge the gap between the public and private sectors, helping to unlock resources to reduce poverty and support local economic development. In her role of representing the views of the private sector and the broader remittance industry, Veronica is a member of different working groups and interacts with regulators around the world and key international bodies, including our organization. She is also on the advisory board of private sector companies. And in the past, she set up a money transfer company herself, focusing on Eastern Europe and, and served as CEO for five years. I like the motto which Veronica is supporting. She believes that everyone has a right to access financial services to grow their businesses and improve their lives. So welcome on board, Veronica. Uh, the second panelist uh, is also an expert with whom we've been collaborating on multiple uh, initiatives. Uh, and one of such is the Contributions and Counting publication, which we asked uh, Mr. Leon Isaac to also speak about. So Leon is a founder and chief executive officer of DMA Global, the specialist uh, the specialist international development company founded in 2007. He is a seasoned expert and business leader in the payments and international development fields with a particular expertise in migrant remittances, diaspora investment, diaspora engagement and financial inclusion. He has over 30 years of hands-on experience in that area of work. He is an observer to the G20 Consultative Committee of the Private-Public Sector Partnership on Remittances, was a managing director of the International Association of Money Transfer Networks, where he interacted with numerous regulators and stakeholders to represent the industry and was a member of the UK government's remittances task force between 2005 and 2010. Leon speaks at various conferences, chaired numerous international events on remittances, including the World Bank, the United Nations and G8. Prior to establishing DMA Global, he was involved with two successful startup remittance businesses. An economist by training, he is currently based in France. Welcome on the panel, uh, Leon. Uh, as always, happy to have you uh, uh, at our events and discussions. The next two speakers are representing actually public authorities, and I'm so thrilled to have uh, among our speakers today, Mr. Gerardo Heriberto Perez Figueroa. He is the Director of Diaspora and Development, uh, a career diplomat with a 15-year career at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He held different responsibilities within the ministry, was an attaché in the General Directorate of Protocol and Orders to the Office of the President of the Republic for three presidential periods, was a part of the team of the General Directorate of Economic Relations that developed the Economic, Commercial and Tourism Councils program. Under their responsibility were the commercial offices in Germany, Spain, People's Republic of China, Republic of China, Taiwan, Chile, Ecuador, Dominic Republic and Colombia. He was minister counselor and deputy head of mission at the embassy of El Salvador in France, non-resident with Algeria, Monaco and Portugal. It's actually a very long list of international experience. Uh, I'm just really impressed to have Mr. Perez as part of our panelists. He was always uh, also participating uh, uh, within the development and engaging um, in charge of the development center of the OECD. Um, so in London, he was representative of El Salvador to the International Coffee Organization and the International Maritime Organization. So with a solid experience of partnering with the private sector, as you see. Before his current assignment as Director of Diaspora and Development of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, he served as Charge uh, d'Affaires of the Embassy of El Salvador in Doha, Qatar, not resident with Kuwait, Oman, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and Palestine. So I, I wonder if there is peace of the world which uh, Mr. Paris hasn't worked in or on. He holds a BBA from the International School of Business and York University. Welcome, Mr. Paris, with us. And uh, another in, a very important uh, panelist uh, is uh, Dr. Abdifata Dirui Ahmed. 
Dr. Abdi Fattah uh, is representing a public structure, public authority, the Somalia's National Institute of Health, but also he has had an excellent uh, and extensive experience of working abroad. With over 15 years of experience in complex health settings across Africa, Asia, and Eastern Europe, Dr. Abdi Fattah has a master's in public health, a policy and management from Oxford University, and a bachelor's degree in biomedical science and laboratory diagnostics technology from Oslo University College. His course of experience started in one of the busiest and biggest university hospitals in Oslo as a clinical scientist specialized in microbiology and infection immunology diagnostic before leading him to the emergency response to humanitarian crisis in different parts of the world. I think this experience in health response is particularly relevant as we are discussing the overarching topic during this dialogue, a response to COVID. So it will be interesting to hear from Dr. Abdi Fattah, of course, on that, but also broader topic uh, that we are um, uh, discussing uh, in terms of diaspora and migrants' contributions. Throughout his 15 years as a public health professional, he served in various capacities in Yemen, Bangladesh, Lebanon, Greece, Uganda, and Kenya with various INGOs, including Oxfam, NRC, WHO, HCR. In 2013, Dr. Abdi Fattah co-founded the Somalia National Institute of Health. Shortly afterwards, he left the institute to pursue a career with the UN before returning to the institute as its executive director. In his current role, he also acts as the COVID-19 incident manager, as well as the IHR focal point. He also presides over major national health projects, uh, such as being the coordinator of the contingency emergency response component. He is a Norwegian citizen. Welcome on board, Dr. Abdi Fattah, as well. So as you see, the experience that among our four speakers is overwhelming. So I would like to, rather than uh, speaking on myself to to uh, to to turn to the first uh, speaker um miss stutzgaard uh with this question uh veronica you represent an interesting organization very important one the international association of money transfer networks the one which joined the swiss uk call to action uh, on keeping remittances flow during covid 19. can you please say a few words about your organization's work so that we, we get to learn the organization, but also why it decided to join the international effort on, a, on paying attention to the situation of remittances during COVID-19, this call to action. Also, from your organization's and membership perspective, what have been most important developments that emerged during COVID-19 pandemic in terms of remittances, cost reduction, support to migrants and their families, and as we discuss, what could governments be doing to support uh, the industry, the money transfer operations, operators, uh, in terms of their uh, work and in, in enhancing uh, their also commitments to reducing the costs, but also supporting migrant families. So please, the floor is yours, Veronica. Thank you very much, Marina. Uh, I would let's say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending where you are connecting. Uh, Thank you very much to the organizers for, for the invitation. Uh, yes, it's uh, why did we decide to join? I, I, would, I would like to structure the, the answer of, of this question, you know, in, in three stages. So first, why we decide why we decided to join. Um, I would like to start uh, with what does it mean for IMTN and its members to be part of this initiative? So IMTN is uh, a non-profit membership association that represents remittance services providers. The remittance services providers have an incredible network around the world. So they were already connected and on the ground and connected with migrants workers when the COVID pandemic struck the world. They were the first one to sense how uh, the situation impacted their customers and they understood how important it was for these migrants to be able to send, continue sending money to their families and friends uh, as they were doing it before the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, for the remittance industry uh, providers, it was a very difficult situation by that time. I mean, we all know what, what happened during the pandemic, so, but it was a very difficult time because they were dealing not only with 
the task to keep remittances flowing, but also dealing with their own challenges that they were having through running a business. Uh, so they were dealing with the decline of remittances volume, they had uh, closed locations, they had limited hours in some countries, staff isolation, they have many uh, members of their staff getting ill, liquidity issues, uh, access to financial services. We have to remember that uh, bank de risking was still active and is still active. I mean, they were closing bank accounts during the lockdown, so it was a problem, and, and many more. Um, so even though the pandemic affected the entire world, um, some countries have been more affected than others, and the lockdowns, I mean, the, the reason that the lockdowns were implemented at different times also that made that the staff of the remittance services provider had to be uh, more responsive to the constant changes in real time. So they have to work daily with their customers in order to help them to figure out what the new reality was on the grounds, on market, and in some cases on regulations. Uh, so uh, beginning of March, 2020, we decided to survey the industry in order to understand the immediate needs the remittance services provider had in order to keep these remittances flowing. Um, it, it, once we had the scenario was terrible, and once we had the responses, we decided to reach out for support to everyone, and I mean, everyone who was on my database, to be honest. Uh, international organizations, intergovernmental organizations, regulators, policy makers, you name it, everyone who would accept to have a video call from us. Um, it was not an easy task. Uh, and normally we, when you have different stakeholders, uh, it's almost unavoidable that they will come with their own agenda. So, uh, but we tried and, and we did it. So when the task force uh, chaired by IFAD was formed, we joined. We saw that as an opportunity for us to share the views of the industry. Uh, and as Marina said before, uh, we were working already uh, with IOM. So IOM was also there. It, it was a, for us, it was a platform where we were all sharing what we could see from the ground and sharing different experience and propose different way of doing things. Uh, then in May came the call to action, which was an initiative from the Swiss government and the UK government. We were also there. We were at a very early stage we joined. So for us, it was um, an excellent opportunity to input uh, from the industry, our perspective. Um, these initiatives are significant, not only because they bring people together, but also because they recognize the importance of addressing these challenges that the industry is facing. And more than, more than that is that we can share the impact that these challenges have with the senders and the receivers of remittances. So especially in times of crisis, these initiatives are very good, very welcome from the industry. So regarding developments uh, that emerged during the COVID-19 pandemic, COVID was a catalyst for the digital transformation. That's something we all know. Uh, so the, from the industry, the industry decided that scaling up was a priority. So for those that had the funding and could, they decided to uh, digitize their services if they were not already working in the digital channels. For those that were already working, operating in digital channels, they decided to increase their presence online with different partnerships uh, to increase in different regions. Uh, so for the remittance services providers, uh, they, the industry decided to invest in digitizing or either accelerating the introduction of these digital remittance services that were already undergoing even before the pandemic. And by linking these 
products and services with the use of financial technology, they were able to offer digital transactions, mobile payment, electronic payments. And in, some, in, in many cases, products specially designed for migrants, what the migrants needed by that time. Uh, and uh, by these, by investing in these, they did not only invest in the business, but they were investing in reducing costs, which is something that we all have been working in the industry for many years, uh, increasing accessibility, providing access for everyone digitally onboarding as many new client customers they could and transparency. We have to remember that some of these customers were coming with the retail experience. So they were expecting to have some of, of the same experience within the remittances. So many started introducing uh, trackers so migrants could see where the transactions are and like that. Um, and with regard on uh, how governments could engage more with the industry, um, there's a lot that government can do. The COVID pandemic not only exposed the deficiencies we have in, in the industry, but also pre-existing challenges we had. Um, so it is right to think that digital solutions have the potential to reduce cost, increase transparency, accessibility, and speed, but it comes with certain challenges. We must agree that it's not just about building an app and expecting customers to use it. Uh, it comes more than that. Governments need to support these initiatives. Uh, for this, we need to ensure that we have an open payment ecosystem. Uh, we need to avoid fragmented and inconsistent regulatory oversight. Uh, otherwise, we are risking increasing financial exclusion instead of financial inclusion. And as I previously said, there's a lot more than governments can do. We need to recognize that this is not the first time remittances is in the agenda of the public sector. It is not the first crisis we have met. Uh, so for the industry, it was not an easy time. It was during the pandemic, it was not easy. Uh, it was quite challenging, challenging to obtain the much needed support of governments and even in some cases, multilateral organizations. Uh, the industry needs proactive support. Even, you know, trade organizations like us need support. During the last 15 years, we were told there's no funding for us. We are until today funded by our members only. Our members are remittance services providers, as I said when I started talking about who is Antium, what is Antium. Our members are remittance service providers. Remittance services providers who are mostly migrants. And for, um, for this reason, I would like you to think about one thing. Every time you hear or read remittances proved to be more resilient than initially expected, please remember one thing. Remember that this industry, the remittance industry has been built by migrants to serve migrants. So remittances are not resilient. Migrants are, migrants did it. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica, for, for this overview of the trends, observations, and of course, your, uh, your basically open and direct uh, ideas in terms of how we can be supporting uh, uh, the, the industry uh, in terms of also contributing to the bigger agendas uh, on, of reducing the cost, but also supporting migrants. And it's exciting to hear, I think it's the first time that I'm hearing that indeed, a lot of founders of those uh, organizations um, which are involved in, in really uh, supporting the financial transactions are migrant owned or migrant initiated. So um, 
um, and indeed, uh, the question is always in terms of how much we can leave the market to regulate itself and find the, this, the solutions uh, about in terms of digital transformation. So there is one opinion saying that, well, there is a lot of progress within the IT structures, within the connectivity. So, but what, what I heard from you also saying is that there is more beyond that. There's also migrants as customers and they need support. There's also those who are involved, MTOs, who have been really at, uh, taking this agenda of reducing the cost very actively. Some of the initiatives are really overwhelming to see how indeed the technologies allow us to help reducing the cost and connect families across the globe of course it's a big agenda and that's why what i heard from you saying also it's important to really continue and support all these different platforms for experience exchange for elaboration of common messages and as well as common understanding in terms of truth of situation because indeed when the world bank came up with a projection of 20 percent reduction of, of remittance costs and all of a sudden uh, towards the end of the year we realized that actually the 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 fall was there but not as dramatic so for us again uh, let's try to to debunk those myths and try to work very concretely through specific initiatives as you, those you mentioned the ifad coordinated the, the, the task force the call to action so thank you very much veronica extremely exciting I'm, I'm always thrilled to to work directly with representatives of the industry because it for us it helps us really define our own actions and really make them relevant more relevant to the real situation on the ground so let me now turn to leon uh, um, uh, and leon also of course not uh, uh, not uh, how to say out an outsider to the remittance industry uh, and he, as i mentioned in my introduction you have also overwhelming experience leon i have a few questions to you of course i know you can speak about remittances you've done that at multiple fora but we thought that today maybe you start opening up our uh, view a little bit or discourse beyond remittances so um uh you have been collaborating with us and indeed this um publication we put together contributions and counting um is is the one which we worked really hard and was not an easy one to conceptualize and come up with basically a proposal of how we can start measuring those contributions beyond remittances so um if looking again maybe if you can say a few words about our collaboration on the publication a bit of your experience but also COVID-19 again go into this topic um so do you think moving forward how can we really become again more tangible in in uh, in bringing all our ideas experience into the concrete situations on the ground how can we start advocating on on migrants contributions which span beyond remittances but also um really uh, support specific initiatives on the ground uh, by by really collecting information uh, becoming more equipped uh, with evidence um, have we seen examples where migrants really started accelerating their support again beyond remittance flows? And again, what are your also since we are trying to conceptualize some messages to the government top three or a few uh, messages or recommendations to governments and policy makers in this regard? So please, Leon, all these questions, how would you respond to this? Great. Um, thanks very much indeed, Marina, um, for that uh, for that great introduction. And it's my pleasure to be uh, on this panel with such uh, esteemed speakers. It's always difficult following um, um, after Veronica. So I'm just glad I'm not talking on remittances directly uh, on this one. Um, perhaps, uh, as you suggested, perhaps just before uh, answering or about the future, just to say a few words about the contributions and, uh, and counting uh, document, which as you say, was quite a challenging task. I think it was really driven because um, we all know that migrants contribute to their uh, countries of origin in a variety of ways. And that many countries are obviously much more aware of this and have taken a proactive approach to um, engage their, their immigrants. Uh, and a growing number are reaching out to them. I, I think the real challenge is that, as we know, it's hard to develop policy um, and so on if we don't actually have um, good data to be able to justify the effort that is put in um, to developing things. So really that was the driver behind um, this exercise. And uh, I think it was really built on the fact that when one thinks about diasporans and, and in a financial way, 
uh, it's nearly always remittances that comes to top of mind, um, which sort of makes the assumption that we know everything we need to know about remittances. And I'm sure anybody who's involved in the industry will know that actually that's not true. But I think we are at least starting to make progress in that area. But in other areas that diasporans contribute to, there's really very little of any quantitative element that's actually been undertaken. So with the help of uh, IOM, we had a great partnership in developing um, this guidance on measuring the economic impact of diaspora beyond remittances. It's actually a structured uh, doc, uh, approach to how to calculate this. It is available on the IOM websites, and I'd encourage everybody to do it. It's in multiple languages now, but it provides guidance for governments and national authorities who are really looking to understand and measure the economic contributions made by their diaspora to their country of uh, origin. In particular, we started with four key areas where we believe diaspora are making a financial contribution at the moment. One of those is uh, investment. Secondly, trade. There's a lot of diasporans who have developed businesses that trade with their country of origin, tourism and philanthropy. Uh, and so the um, contributions and counting actually provides users with a structured approach to understanding, firstly, existing data collection frameworks where they exist and how these can be modified to actually isolate foreign capital inflows made by the diaspora through those channels that I've just mentioned. Um, data that's then uh, generated from this exercise can be utilized to make more precise policy interventions uh, and develop more effective programs to engage the diasporas um, as developmental actors. So as I said, this is a live project. I'm delighted to say we're also piloting it with two countries at the moment, which is great. Um, and we think this will grow over time. So I think maybe I'll stop the advert for that there and move on to um, your question around really whether it's relevant still, more relevant or less relevant as a result of COVID-19 uh, and how we can move forward with it. So um, my real response to that is I think it's absolutely relevant and probably in many ways COVID-19 has made it more so. Um, as we know, and Veronica very eloquently outlined, um, the role of migrants in supporting their families uh, and in many ways, by extension, their countries of uh, origin has actually been heightened because of the pandem pandemic. Even though many, many um, migrants suffered um, themselves during the pandemic, they also had a other responsibility in many cases of supporting their families and countries. And it was interesting that many countries actually looked to their diasporas to help them through this crisis. And I know we're going to hear about some of the health um, support functions that were provided by diasporas, but just on a financial means, certainly the diasporas were top of mind. Um, the challenge is we don't really know uh, how much has been contributed um, and uh, we don't have a comprehensive list of the different ways either. Um, if we could actually measure that, then that would really help to provide supporting policies, not just from the countries that are receiving the, uh, the benefits, but also from those who provide support to those countries as well. Um, and we really feel that the only way to do this is to do it through a structured approach. I think, you know, times of crisis, we always are in that terrible sort of reactive phase. So the more data we have before we start taking decisions, the better the decisions can be. So a long way of saying apologies for the length of that answer that I do think it's particularly relevant. Uh, in terms of some examples, we've certainly seen a number of examples, uh, again, some harder to quantify than others, of where migrants have accelerated their support um, not necessarily just through remittances. So uh, one example would be in Pakistan. Uh, some of you may be familiar with something called the Roshan Digital Account. This was actually a, as, as the name implies, a digital um, investment uh, and um, money transfer, so, oh, well, in savings uh, area 
introduced by the government of Pakistan, specifically aimed at the non-resident Pakistanis anywhere in the world. It was quite revolutionary from the Pakistani viewpoint in particular because it was very easy for the non-resident Pakistanis to be able um, to actually establish this account. Uh, administrative side of it was made quite simple. And then this platform basically has allowed the government to provide a number of different opportunities for diasporans to um, invest to support the country. So they've offered government bonds, they've offered a range of savings programs, they're now offering incentives, making it easier for people to actually buy um, cars and other uh, investment products, let's say for their for Pakistanis, for them to buy for their families back home. And they've also um, undertaken this in a very dedicated manner. They put a lot of promotion to it. They've really reached out very well to the Pakistanis all around the world, either using a variety of tools, social media, obviously, but also the diplomatic missions have really been tasked with promoting this. And the results have been really impressive. So in the first 12 months, it was launched in September 2020. So in the middle of the pandemic, since then, over $2 billion has actually been placed through these accounts in various uh, investments of one sort of another. So if you think, uh, and to put that into perspective, that's somewhere around about seven or 8% of the total amount received in formal remittances in the country in a year. So in just 12 months, they've been able to catalyze a really uh, large sum. So that's been encouraging. Um, another example, which is sort of on similar lines, but maybe not with so many varieties, is the Philippines, um, which has issued a, a Progresso, it's called Progresso Retail Treasury Bond. Uh, this was only issued a couple of months ago, but it was specifically issued to overseas-based Filipinos um, anybody could actually apply, but it was really marketed and promoted to overseas Filipinos, again, using a mobile app um, and really very much um, encouraging them to invest in a series of um, or in the bond to basically provide funds for the government to help it in its response to um, the COVID uh, crisis and pandemic and help with the recovery coming afterwards. Well, what's interesting with this is that small investors who are sp specifically targeted to um, have accounted for about 80% of all the transactions that have been made at an amount somewhere around about 10,000 Filipino pesos per transaction. Um, and these people have come from 24 different countries. So again, it's not a remittance, this is actually a government bond and it's been very much uh, used um, for that by the government and success already looks like it's been successful. Um, then I wanted to do one philanthropic, pardon uh, my pronunciation, um, example, which would be um, by, from a man who I think many of you in the remittances industry, well, you'll all know is uh, Ismail Ahmed, who's the founder of World Remit, a digital uh, money transfer company who's from Somaliland. And he's launched a $500 million fund, basically to help um, it drive entrepreneurial uh, development in Somaliland. Uh, he's committed a significant amount of his own wealth and investments over the next 10 years um, to really help develop this. And I think, you know, part of what he's trying to do is um, not just to help with COVID, although he has put in over a million dollars worth of his own money into helping with personal protective equipment and laboratory wow. testing in the country. He's also um, looking to develop for the long term. So he's helping to actually educate one million adults and young people to help them acquire um, literacy skills, including um, financial literacy. And he's actually helping, hoping that the fund with others will double the literacy rate from 45% to 90% by 2023. So I think those are three good examples of where activities have been taken that are not remittance related by diasporans to really help their countries. And I guess part of the good thing with all of those is 
there is a measure of how much has come in anyway, and that will enable, I hope, other countries to follow suit. And so finally, just to finish off my comments, um, I think you asked for sort of what can governments do? What are the top three things they could do in this area? I would sort of say actually measure, measure, and measure again. I think, you know, that's key area for, we need data to be able to make informed decisions. But I think specifically um, what governments can do, one of the things is to uh, really demonstrate political will and support towards the diaspora by if they don't have a specific area or ministry um, that is looking at uh, diaspora impact on their country, then that's one thing that should definitely be established. And I know some of our other speakers are from countries that have that. So that's great. We can learn from each other. Um, secondly, I would say, come back to the data. Really, we need to understand how data is collected at the moment. And then in most cases, it's just not linked up across government um, or we're not collecting the type of data that actually enables us to be able to um, provide a, a real value of diaspora contribution. So we need to address that. We need to take that systematic approach. And I think overriding all of that is we need to have a plan of what we're going to do with this data. Um, we don't just want to collect data for the sake of co um, uh, collecting it. What we really want is to have um, the data so that we can actually make programs that make a difference, that encourage diasporans to support their country of origin um, and really provide a mutually supportive network. So perhaps I'll stop there, um, but obviously happy with questions later on and so on. Thank you, Marina. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Leon. I was really intrigued to hear those concrete examples. And then uh, uh, and of also your answer is very close to my heart, measure and measure and measure, because indeed that was the reason why we pulled our intellectual capacity together to start capturing information to because for development of policies legislation we need to have uh, uh, you know evidence to explain and and, and uh, uh, exemplify the the concrete examples and 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 once uh, we attach numbers um, then it becomes very convincing uh, uh, and, and and really our decision makers really start uh, understanding what what we are speaking about but of course the examples uh, maybe data is not necessarily numbers but also data what qualitative examples of concrete initiatives that you spoke about these are also absolutely extremely convincing um, and then again that's that's why i think having these platforms exchanges and bringing our understanding together is absolutely crucial and that's what we are doing here today so many things um again i don't want to be the one to, who is talking a lot because again we have two more speakers right now to to maybe follow up on on the thread of thought we've been building and i want to turn um to our next speaker, Mr. Perez, who represents the, um, the Directorate of Diaspora from El Salvador. Uh, Mr. Perez, you've heard the interventions of Veronica and Leon, uh, speaking from the voice of the private sector, explaining the trends. Um, so, and we would really be very, very interested in hearing from your side. Uh, and again, uh, when I was reading your bio, it's impressive you've had multi multiple experience of working in different capacities you you know the private sector very well and in your now vision of working as a director of the the, the diaspora agency in el salvador um so could you maybe also um say a few words about the experience in el salvador during covid 19 have you witnessed those examples of of support um from from diaspora communities uh, uh, during the pandemic, uh, be it in, in the form of uh, remittances or other uh, forms of engagement, um, but also um, your vision. So I understand you've been not so long in the post. So how you envisage, you know, your role, your agency's role in really uh, support uh, the engagement with diaspora from uh, from um, uh, to, to to assist. Uh, with the response to the pandemic, but also a broader economic or broader development in the country. So we are thrilled to listen uh, to your thoughts, please, Mr. Perez. Hi, thank you. Uh, 
Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd just like, first of all, to begin uh, giving everybody th a thanks for including us in this panel. Uh, actually, I would like to make a, a, a direct uh, comment on what Mr. Isaacs was mentioning. Uh, with the new government, with President uh, Bukele's government, the actual administration, uh, there was a, a, a decision made. So, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we hear, but there is a parallel sound. If we could look into that, please, from the support team. Please continue. But anyway, I can press some things over here as well. Somebody else has their microphone on i think we are told that it's something from your side but let's let's continue and see how much interrupted it is so for, so far we hear you well okay thank you sorry it happens with with this new technological uh, era so so just going back to what i was saying uh, with president bukele's administration there was a decision made to create uh, a new vice ministry, uh, which is the vice ministry that I belong to, uh, which of course is within the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. It's the vice ministry for diaspora and human mobility. Uh, and why was it created? It was created because uh, throughout our history, our diaspora has pretty much been, uh, it's, it's, it's been taken uh, care of, but I think that, that, that taken into, into consideration how big our diaspora is, uh, now we have a vice ministry that we focus completely on all their needs. I think something that's very important uh, within this panel that, that, that we are, are being very active with is financial inclusion, uh, because uh, that is something only our diaspora, but most of our country uh, is lacking. Uh, but first of all, I just like to give you some numbers just to, to give you a, a, an idea of, of how big and how important I, our diaspora is to my country. Okay, so so here in El Salvador, our, la our latest census says we are about 6.3 million Salvadorians in El Salvador. Uh, living abroad, we have 3.1 million Salvadorians living in the United States, uh, registered, of course. And then we also have very big diasporas in Canada, Australia, Spain, Italy, Mexico, uh, and other countries. So, so if you can see, this is almost a third of our population living abroad. Uh, but of course, everybody that leaves sends family remittances. Uh, these family remittances have improved the living conditions of thousands of families. And, it's con and it con con contributes very, very uh, strongly to our economy. Uh, our GDP is, it, it, remittances represent about 24% of our GDP. And it generates an, imp an important contribution through the valued value tax through the consumptions of goods and services. Now going to COVID-19. In COVID-19, uh, actually, we, we, we had an increase of, of, of remittances. Uh, we, we, in, in, in 2020, we closed with $5.9 billion in remittances. Uh, but of course, we, 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 we can relate this to uh, the economic relief measures that were carried out by uh, where most of our uh, diaspora lives, the United States government. Uh, also, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic had another, uh, another uh, number of, 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 of uh, uh, new uh, things happening. For example, uh, with, with, with the uh, financial inclusion, uh, in the latest census that we did with our banking sector, it showed that 70% of Salvadorians don't have a formal bank account. Uh, that's a very big number. Uh, but seeing that during the lockdown uh, period, when El Salvador was locked down, people couldn't go to the courier service, they couldn't go to the remittance to, 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 to where they could, they, they could go pick up their money. So they had to pretty much uh, open up a, uh, a, a bank account in order to have electronic transactions made and be able to receive their money. Uh, but also, there's another very important thing that I would like to mention is where our remittances come from. As I was saying, uh, most of our remittances come from the U.S. Uh, in I think in the last number that we have, we had $4.6 billion uh, of remittances coming from the U.S., which is 95.4% of the total remittances that we receive. Uh, and then, of course, in Canada, we have 46.3 million. In Spain, 18.7 million, Italy, 16.5, Mexico, 5.3 million. 
but 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 what does this mean? This means that there's a big uh, dependency on remittances from my country, you could say. Uh, so so what does my country want to do? What what are, you, what, what are we looking to do uh, in order to 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 to, to, to maybe include our our diaspora and in investing in other sectors, not only sending the remittances. Uh, we are, a, for example, we're preparing a new law called the Law of Human Mobility, uh, which a big part of this law is uh, telling our banking our banking sector to help us include our uh, diaspora, uh, giving them a, a more flexible legislation. There's a big, very, very simple thing. For example, uh, in diasporas in, that, that went to the US, in, in our case, uh, they left El Salvador. When they leave El Salvador, they don't have a formal banking record here in, 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 in my country. So when they try to invest, when they try to come back home, uh, they can't receive a, 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 a a decent loan. Uh, so, 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 what we're trying to do is we're trying to, to make this more flexible. We're trying to to make this more flexible for our people. So, so as I was saying, uh, another program. Sorry, I would like I would like to mention is a program called Investing in Building from the United States for a Better El Salvador. Uh, this is something that we're doing through. Uh, instead of you sending your 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 money to 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 El Salvador in remittances, uh, our migrants can buy a gift card and they can go to a convenience store and the, their family members can use uh, the money to buy construction materials. Why is that? Because we're trying to make all the, the money that's coming through remittances to be productive. Uh, so, so as I was saying, uh, for, for my country, it's very important, number one, to give them options, to give our diaspora options uh, to, 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 to send the remittances as well. Uh, I, I just want to mention I am not a cryptocurrency specialist. Uh, I just want to make that clear uh, before the panel opens up. Uh, but I can also mention the option that we that, that 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 my president has given our diaspora with Bitcoin. So they are uh, we now you can send your remittance through Bitcoin to El Salvador, which is going to exclude the the, the a certain uh, percentage that is taken through sending the, the remittances through a, a, normal, a normal courier service. So we're hoping that is going to make a, our, 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 our nationals be able to send their, 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 uh, their remittances in 100% uh, instead of having their, uh, the, 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 the interest taken from them. So pretty much uh, just in, 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 in an overview, I just wanted to let everybody know that, that El Salvador uh, we, we the remittances have a direct and positive impact in our country and 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 we are also uh, the government of salvador we, we are very motivated to keep on opening up economic inclusion give our people options uh, which is very important and i just like to close out my intervention with a very simple but accurate statement that our president Nayib Bukele made uh, i'm going to say it first in spanish it's going to be easier for me uh, and then i'll say it in english so in spanish it says uh, como no amar a nuestra diaspora Como país, durante toda nuestra historia le dimos tan poco y ellos responden dándonos tanto. What does this mean? How not to love our diaspora? As a country, throughout our history, we have given, we have given, given them so little, but they respond by giving us so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Paris, for your thoughtful um... Introduc uh, in intervention and, and, and the final uh, statement actually touched me deeply in my heart. Uh, why? Because, uh, you know, a lot of we have had a ministerial uh, meeting uh, convening um, heads of agencies of diaspora um, structures in different countries. It could be a part of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, it could be sitting somewhere else, but really we noticed already in 2013 that there were almost more than 60 or even 100 countries which have started setting up those structures which start engaging more more consistently with with the population who left the country and we know sometimes it's really people leave indeed um, not, not necessarily because uh, sometimes they just not necessarily live with good and good feelings about the country, and this is a very sensitive topic. But I think your the phrase what you said uh, is, is interesting because 
there is a recognition that uh, it's not that we expect because somebody goes and leaves the country that 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 they will be necessarily engaging and, and really supporting the country. So they really, this is something which requires a lot of collaboration and partnership and really the trust. And this this quotation was really interesting because indeed there is a, now a much more advanced understanding that diasporas really are real partners. So we need to support them and, and really uh, create all those enabling conditions uh, uh, and, and very specific initiative you mentioned in terms of uh, ability to open a banking account. Uh, I think Leon spoke about this, this challenges which we are aware about this status of resident or non-resident within the banking industry. So we know that also in your region, many governments have started issuing diaspora cards, which allow this possibility of, of really new transnational identity emerging from the point of view, still maybe retaining uh, residence somewhere, but really engaging more actively. Or even when they come back, they can really be supported in terms of credit history and, and lack of that. So no, but it's exciting. Thank you so much. And again, uh, a lot of uh, ideas, uh, something what you haven't mentioned, uh, uh, what Leon asked now advocated for other countries to start joining and testing the methodology we developed together in terms of how to start setting up systems in the country to start measuring those flows and, and incidents beyond just remittance flows, because you, you presented very nice numbers but really there how do we measure the investment uh, of, of our Salvadorians in, in in the country how do we so there is a methodology we are introduced we, we are not uh, pushing you too much but please hopefully you you can uh, review it and and we are welcoming uh, partnership with all countries uh, towards you know collaborating and testing and make it stronger so the next speaker Mr. Difatar, uh, now turning to you, uh, and I know that you prepared your intervention, which will be going maybe not necessarily into the so-called financial knowledge transfer, financial transfer, economic transfer, but really we're zooming into this engagement with um, uh, diaspora from the point of view of them bringing their knowledge experiences, uh, and, and of course with a focus on, on the health sector, health service provision. So um, could you please reflect on on the response of diaspora to COVID-19 pandemic in Somalia and uh, whether you could bring maybe concrete examples how a diaspora representative was engaging in a specific medical institution. So also um, with you, with your institute, uh, we are collaborating on the implementation of one of our flagship programs in terms of support of return of qualified diaspora representatives specifically for the health sector. So maybe you say a few words about that program and, and specifically whether it was helpful during the pandemic, which is of course still ongoing um, and uh, also in terms of, um, you know, uh, your role of the institute and maybe the thinking in the government, uh, to what extent you're coordinating with other parts of the government in terms of strengthening these uh, initiatives, the return of diaspora also for transfer of knowledge, and how can we can uh, maybe create supportive structures, policies, laws to make it really sustainable and scaling up. Please, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Marina and uh, colleagues, and uh, indeed very insightful presentations from our colleagues. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm saying greetings from Mogadishu. And before I answer the question, I think as a Somali and I've been myself a diaspora, I would like to touch base on the few to give you a perspective and the Somalis being uh, known as a business community throughout uh, wherever they are. I think uh, I will just want to say that to start with uh, the fact that uh, the largest population of Somalia outside Africa and the Middle East they are in basically based in uh, USA and specifically in Minnesota. And I think uh, we have, uh, Somalis have been known to engage diaspora and the communities they left at home and also have uh, somehow marked and contributed in their adopted countries. And uh, for example, in the US, they have also now a congresswoman. Also in Canada, they have uh, ministers and they have been engaging, making sure that the country at the same time building up their countries. Also in the remittance side, I think uh, I myself have been using remittance when I've been outside the country to make sure and uh, to transfer to my people back at home. I remember 
before the remittance we used to go to the to the to the shops and take it there lightly but nowadays there is online banking i think uh, mr has touched on the world remit i don't know if online banking it's make easier and so thank you and this is uh, very close to us my uh, institution is national institute of health i'm also an incident manager and uh, i think uh, marina did a proper introduction on that i will not uh, repeat i will uh, want to say is uh, in 2008 i think uh, there is a program uh, migration for development in africa has started some time back and uh, this was and uh, an initiative uh, with support from IOM and other partners, uh, specifically, I think the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Finland to engage and the diaspora communities, the, uh, those who have technical expertise, because after the civil war in uh, Somalia, there has been a brain drain. Most of the, and, uh, the people left the country and uh, also to re-engage them back, you know, it's required uh, people have established in their adopted countries and uh, being citizens there and also being productive citizens to attract them back to their countries is, you know, and uh, it's not something easy because already people have established themselves. So this program, I think, and give an opportunity and uh, for those uh, diasporas to really and, uh, and go back. And it was started as a shorter project, six months, three months, to go back, contribute, build the capacities of the staffs, and then come back. You know, they take Sabbath leaves or from the other jobs. But this really has helped and uh, it has supported. And uh, me as being the incident manager and the uh, head of the infections departments, I really um, was, I think, uh, very, very, and I got very good helping hands from, I think, force is in uh, doctors from uh, this program uh, migration for development also known as ida and some of them are highly qualified infectious diseases doctors and they were really at the and working uh, day and night during the first and the second wave of covid-19 making sure that uh, they build and support the local doctors and also to give them a moral boost that uh, their qualified brothers and sisters uh, in shoulder with them. This really has helped and uh, it is uh, up to now we have this uh, support. One of the, I think, uh, as I've mentioned earlier, was the challenges that sustainability of these uh, programs. You know, <clears throat> when you have a short-term pro pro project or program that is dependent on uh, shortages or uh, there will be a gap. And sometimes these gaps can create and uh, can can create a challenge. So this is one of the things I think uh, we have really been working closely with OEM to see how this can be addressed. And for example, not only in the national, but we have also Somalia now is a federal member states, and we have the six and federal member states and the southwest and Jubaland, Puntland, and uh, Hirshavele. So these federal member states, they are an, um, in charge of the health sectors, but overall it, the Ministry of Health and the M and NIH are the coordinating agency. So there have been also very, very good and excellent staffs that went there and have supported. For example, the first time we had the onset of COVID-19 was around 20 in March. And uh, this was incident started as a student arriving from China who and uh, came with the COVID. So once they, it was, it was specifically after two months. I think we had a, a, a community transmission of the COVID nineteen, and it was no longer an imported case, and this transmission spread. So this really and um, it was something new to everybody, and uh, there was also the the myth that people believed that COVID will not affect me, or this is something uh, you know all these myths that have been circulating around the world. And uh, I think uh, people, even the local doctors, and they, they didn't know how to handle it at first, but now we have incident management structures and we really and, uh, and are grateful. We did the first PCR test in, uh, I think, uh, Feb and, uh, February and March around that area. And those PCR tests, that was the first time that diagnosis was done in country. 
And this was also supported by an, uh, the staffs that have been seconded to the ministry. So this is, uh, I think the migrant's contribution specifically here in Somalia is, uh, I cannot, uh, you know, and uh, finish it within this uh, few minutes here. It can go on and on and on for several days. So, and not only that, also, and not only the Ministry of Health, but all, all other line ministries and uh, government institutions, there's a huge, huge contribution of the diaspora network. And uh, I think the only window I can say that, and they were able to come to the country was through this uh, program, uh, MIDA. And uh, I think for the past uh, few months, I've been hearing back and forth that there is going to be shortages of uh, sustainability of this. And this is somehow something that I really would like to take this opportunity to address this conference that, and uh, we really need this kind of transferable skills and uh, in the, throughout the country. And uh, such things, we will, it's better if we look through a sustainability lens. So, and uh, <clears throat> if, for example, the, and in my and the section, the health sector, all the pro, uh, they have been these staffs or expatriates have been contributing into the all and very very key important and places uh, like I previously mentioned, like a uh, infectious and medicine department, the laboratory assurance of the quality and quality controls, and also at uh, advocating and policies. So I'm really glad that I am. Uh, part of this panel. And uh, I've also been working very closely in IOM country office in Somalia and also the regional office at Nairobi. We have been trying to see how together we can make sure that these programs are sustainable and we have you know, this pool of experts circulating within the country at every moment I go. I think and uh, the people at the diaspora need to need. I think this is, um, I've been myself a diaspora for many years. I think uh, most people really are eager back to contribute back to their country. But people sometimes, and you know, find themselves helpless. They don't know how they can contribute, you know. How can they make sure that, you know, they can go back to the country. And I think such programs, of you know and telling them yes you want to contribute to this is we need your expertise reverse brain drain to the country is very very important uh, and milestone and uh, I'm also working with the country office here to make sure that I advocate as a national and also as a executive director for the National Institute of Health I want to really to advocate uh, for maintenance and sustainability of these programs across the country. And in terms of uh, remittance, really, it is, uh, I saw a um, few scientific and publications documents that have been published here in the country about the socioeconomical impacts of COVID-19 and the remittance. I think <clears throat> it is no doubt that really COVID has disrupted the health, not only the health sector, but also economically. It really made, uh, people, you know, and some people are isolated in their own home countries or in their adopted countries. They cannot go out as send fast. Some of the people, there have been layoffs in many countries and uh, that uh, due to the COVID impact. And this is uh, really an, uh, a big, big problem. One of the programs also when as a doctor and an infectious medicine, like we have been seeing mixed messages given uh, uh, to the patients, for example. In COVID, when you, you are suspected of having a COVID-19, you are told, stay at home, isolate yourself. And now here in my country, the, <clears throat> we have like, if you see fever, we, there is a malaria infection. Malaria infection has high fever. And you are told to stay at home when you get fever and it might be malaria. So this is, you know, some of the messages that really and across the globe needs to be affected. And also, and uh, <clears throat> really, and when I see most of the programs across the country, people are concentrated on, you know, COVID-19, COVID but I have not seen really in maternal healthcare and, and, and pregnant women and COVID-19 cases. You know, this, 
we have tried to adopt it and uh, and uh, the documents and procedures to 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 fix into this i think uh, the impact of covid is still ongoing on and uh, the worst of all is like when as a country we received a donation of vaccines from uh, well wishers and and uh, and the covax facilities actually when we received the vaccines it was a time whereby there has been a lot of uh, rumors about the vaccines that uh, and uh, what is has been some of the rumors so we are trying and now we're very and, and glad to have received the vaccine and the vaccines uptake is improving and uh, i think uh, across africa and uh, mauritania has reached a 10 percent target of the vaccine we are also making sure that the people are vaccinated i think that is the only way that uh, and covid 19 is here to stay with us people have been having the issues that the, and the, the disease is going away but vaccination i think is the the, the the way forward and we really are making working closely with all our diaspora networks so that they are able and to contribute also <clears throat> on the health sector if i say overall some of the essential health packages have been uh, have, you know the some of the diseases like uh, the tb programs and uh, and uh, other other diseases have really went COVID has taken over the headlines and uh, these diseases are still here the neglected the infectious diseases everything but everybody focus was COVID COVID and still those uh, diseases that are here have not been addressed so I would really would like to take this opportunity to inform the panel and everybody and the donors maybe if they can hear this that and the COVID is here, yes, but the other diseases are also here. And some of the countries, the third world countries, and that really have been having struggling before with these infectious diseases. And uh, the pandemic has really, yes, it is there, but it has really made other diseases busy, but they're still there. So we really need, uh, I want to also light shed on that. And uh, my and, uh, and, uh, request is that I think such forums for dialogue and the discussions are really, really and very important. And I've benefited to hearing from uh, colleagues in the panel and Veronica, Leon and uh, Perez have been able to benefit what we have said from and get the insight. I think it's a good uh, platform for discussions and insights so that we are able really uh, to see and, uh, and uh, contribute to the, to the bits and bits of the issues that have been discussed. So thank you very much. And uh, today is Friday. That's why I'm dressed like this. It's normally an off day here in Somalia. So I'm really glad to be here with you. Thank you very much. And have a good evening. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdi Fattar. Uh, and uh, I didn't realize that you were sacrificing your day off. So particularly thank you to, uh, to, to jo for joining us. Um, and indeed, uh, what you've spoken about uh, the complexity of, of responding to multiple crises, uh, and again, the importance of really remaining agile and, and reacting and partnering and bringing all the processes together is absolutely crucial. And the fact that you spoke about malaria and TB still being around, I can imagine how hard it is indeed in the conditions when you do, don't have the, the good health system in place and, 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 and the overwhelming evidence that you spoke about of, of how actually migrant communities and diaspora are supporting with the response in the case of, of your country and your institutions. So. Um, there is one question which I would like to really pose to, to all the panelists, but also uh, all the participants of this session, because we only have maybe 10 minutes left. And we do know that there is one uh, intervention from uh, uh, the representative of Azerbaijan, which we would like to, to really give the floor to. But the overwhelming question, which I would like everyone to think about, and, and I will re return to it, uh, is, Moving forward, again, we, we, all, each of you have spoken has spoken about the importance of, of uh, coming together, the, the, the bringing evidence, becoming more sophisticated in, in, in capturing data, advocating for the importance of connections with the migrant communities, diaspora communities. This, these are real, uh, real people, real cases. Actually, a lot of us have this migrant background in our 
blood in our histories. So, and when we look into the uh, International Migration Forum review and the global dialogue uh, for migration, which we are supporting with the implementation, um, and this is the, the, the topic of the next uh, panel, uh, which is happening in 10 minutes. So we have uh, learned from our colleagues from the Secretariat that objective 19 about contributions of migrants and objective 20 about remittances are some ones, uh, the, the ones which the governments haven't been really bringing a lot of evidence forward. When we started looking into the voluntary uh, review and, and, and um, uh, re reports from the countries in terms of the global compact, migration governance, these objectives are not finding um, sufficient evidence, uh, sufficient space in the reports. So how can we ensure that moving towards the, uh, the discussions uh, in, in, the, in 2022, and looking into the compact with the, all the objectives, which really is uh, there to advocate for the uh, contribution of migrants, how can we, which measures can we take together to ensure that this content, this, these aspects of uh, migration governance and partnership with diaspora and remittances and partnership with private sector, the, the remittance industry, that they are really not lost in, in the process, that we are not uh, forgetting about those important policy areas. So that's a question to everyone, to the panelists, please. You'll, I'll definitely go back to you uh, with one uh, maybe um, uh, minute uh, response, but now I'm opening the floor for everyone to contribute with your questions, answers, also those who have joined us online. Uh, please pick up your questions uh, to our panelists or answers to my question. But before I'm giving the floor to the distinguished representative of uh, Azerbaijan, uh, who wanted to make an intervention, please. Do we have still? Okay, online, I see you, please. Good afternoon. Can you hear me well? We hear you very well, please proceed. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's an honor for me to join this panel on behalf of the State Migration Service of the Republic of Azerbaijan. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has challenged human mobility and migration management across the whole world. With measures uh, introduced by governments to flatten the curve of infections, the COVID-19 pandemic has already greatly impacted mobility and migration. In order to mitigate the negative impacts of COVID-19, Azerbaijan was guided with the best practices of the majority of countries and recommendations of international organizations. During the first days of the COVID-19 pandemic, Azerbaijan built its migration policy on maximum convenience of migrants, reducing the administrative procedures uh, almost to zero and broad promotion of digitalization. In order to raise awareness of migrants on the procedures applied, we increased our focus on information campaigns tar tar targeted to specific migrant groups. Moreover, despite all the limitations related with pandemic, a number of social assistance projects have been implemented for vulnerable groups. For Azerbaijan, IOM remains a key partner in the field of migration partnerships. OEM's timely involvement and support to migrants and countries has become more vital in face of preventing the pandemic. In this regard, we highly appreciate the regional project for source caucuses aimed at promoting migrant, migrant inclusive response to COVID-19, assisting stranded and vulnerable migrants in the region. We are currently working on several projects in line with the GCM with the support and contribution of OEM. One of the recently launched projects with the support of OEM Development Fund aims to establish a regional training center on migration in Azerbaijan, which would assist to improve the process of training and education related to migration in the region and to invest in the capacity building on migration and development.
Among the various policies and activities conducted by the government of Azerbaijan for implementation of GCM objectives, support to evidence-based policy making upholding the existing international legal and policy frameworks, particularly GCM and uh, SDGs, are worth to mention. Another important initiative towards uh, fulfilling our commitments within uh, GCM is the establishment of the United Nations Network on Migration in Azerbaijan in July 2020. I am delighted to note that currently, jointly with OEM, we are working on a new project on improving the socio-economic effects of remittances in Azerbaijan. The State Migration Service pays special attention to the improvement of dialogue with all stakeholders of migration processes, thus the development of relations with the private sector and application of innovative methods of, in migration management is always on the agenda. In this regard, an advisory board was established under the State Migration Service to bring together entrepreneurs functioning in our country. The main objective of the board is to deliver necessary information about work permits to employers and to promote regular migration. Dear ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, I am now obliged to comment on what has been said by the representative of Armenia in his statement yesterday. Also, the statement abused this platform in order to cover up its real political intentions, in particular its failed policy of aggression and occupation against Azerbaijan. It's oddly interesting to see a representative of a country which has caused for forced displacement of more than one million persons with uh, its ethnic cleansing and aggression policy to build its statement around people on the move by false accusations and groundless claims. First of all, we would like to stress that the act of capitulation, which was signed on November 10, has brought an end to a 30-year-long occupation by Armenia of the internationally recognized territories of Azerbaijan and has restored historical justice in our region. The counteroffensive operation of Azerbaijan that started in September of 2020 was aimed at protection of its population as well as restoration of its territorial integrity, officially recognized by the international community, including through re relevant U UN Security Council resolutions that will enable return of more than 750,000 displaced people to their homelands in safety and with dignity. Second, the international community has witnessed numerous instances of indiscriminate and deliberate shell shelling by Armenia of Azerbaijani civilians and civilian objects located both in close vicinity to and far beyond uh, the area of military operations using ballistic mis missiles and cluster munitions that resulted in killing of 101 Azerbaijani civilians including children, women, and elderly, and enduring more than 423 people in districts and cities of Azerbaijan. Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International in their statements also confirmed the use of cluster munitions by Armenia during those missile attacks. In the end, we call on Armenia, instead of abusing this platform and accusing Azerbaijan with fabricated and groundless uh, statements to stop spreading the ideas of revanchism and hatred against Azerbaijan and to take steps towards the peace treaty on the basis of mutual recognition of territorial integrity, sovereignty and internationally recognized borders. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much uh, for your intervention. And uh, I would like to also refer to collaboration with your state migration service during the Marrakesh summit. We had uh, a joint event um, uh, when we were discussing the global compact for migration in December, 2018. Your representative was with us in Marrakesh actually advocating for the importance of engaging with migrant communities and diaspora organizations. And, and I was really, 
really excited to hear about the measures that you've taken in terms of setting this advisory council with entrepreneurs uh, residing abroad. So I think um, indeed um, the, the experiences we have shared today are absolutely um, very interesting and, and, and important. I'm looking at our colleagues to see whether we still have any questions from uh, the audience online, any interventions, any responses to my question in terms of how we can uh, enhance the, uh, you know, this uh, joint uh, messaging advocacy for these specific two objectives. One idea that we had uh, in our organization was to really take stock uh, and really go back to that platform of a dialogue with member states, but also diaspora organizations uh, following the model we had in 2013 of the ministerial. So one idea that we have come up with is to organize a global diaspora summit. Um, so we are welcoming uh, feedback on such an initiative and soon we will be approaching member states and other partners in terms of uh, really defining a possibility of such an event. So that's a little bit of spoiler towards your end. But now before we close and I know that our um, the next session is extremely important maybe a very very brief um, response to the question of how we can really ensure that in the next months we are pulling together advocacy and messaging to, uh, with the governments with, within the, all the uh, dialogues and platforms uh, in the next month 2022 moving towards the global compact for migration which will be reviewed uh, in the first half of, of the year so let me turn uh, to the panelists and we maybe Veronica very brief literally 30 seconds to you if I can uh, you know your final statement and suggestions over yes of course uh, I would suggest strong strong and sustainable partnerships with all between all stakeholders and less remittance washing interesting remittance washing i really picked up a lot of very interesting ideas from your side thank you for being with us and thank you for suggestion and and really uh, confirmation that such dialogue such platforms are important please leon uh, for you maybe the same question or final statement so moving forward what would be your recommendation well, I think just on what I discussed earlier, I think it's really moving from having a theoretical approach to really countries adopting and practicing improved ways of measuring, um, bringing more imagination. And I think a lot of this is about um, actually raising awareness that it is possible to do this. In the past, I think it's always been viewed as too hard. I think we need to get out there and really publicize, show examples of countries that do it well, and really introduce it. We have to sell it, I think, in many ways, and sell the benefits of doing it. Um, not very revolutionary, but I think we just have to get on and do it now. Do it now. That's very important. Something what our organization is very much committed to. You know, we we are the biggest. We have the biggest part of, of the works really happening in the country's regional offices. So, and uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, so the the data, the the, the measuring, the the information uh, is absolutely crucial. Uh, Mr. Paris, from your side, uh, what would be your maybe final? quick uh, either answer to my question about GCM implementation. Should, do we need platforms for gatherings uh, in addition to the ones we have or anything that you would like to share with us, please? Uh, yes, platforms for gathering, very important. These spaces for us uh, are, are, are spaces that we, we get to hear other experiences. Uh, we will re be reaching out to Mr. Isaacs very shortly to start looking into the measuring of, of, of remittances. Uh, I think as long as we know more, we know what way we have to walk. So uh, with the diaspora, that sounds very, very keen for us. So, so uh, looking forward to keep on uh, being part of these uh, dialogue platforms and thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Abdi Fattah, please, uh, your final remarks, suggestions, recommendations. And thank you very much. I think uh, I, I was having internet problems, so the bandwidth was not okay. I'm back. And uh, thank you very much. I think uh, my recommendations will be and uh, continuous engaging and you know in dialogue, or creating platforms for dialogue to make sure that uh, we are able to see and also encouraging the sustainability of these programs, and also creating awareness among the diaspora that the importance of this. Thank you. 
Absolutely. Sustainability of our initiatives on the ground is also absolutely crucial, yes. And how do we build capacities on the ground to, to continue engaging with diaspora? This is absolutely important. So I would like to thank everyone, every single one of you. I hope you, you really enjoyed being with us, certainly us, uh, myself, and I hope I'm representing the, the, the opinion of, of our speakers, our uh, participants sitting here uh, in person, but also those who have been with us uh, online. Um, for this really insightful discussion, uh, food for thought, and I'm happy to hear that there are already networks being built and, and connections created. That was the purpose. And uh, over to my colleagues for the continuation of the other panels. And thank you, everyone, once again. Thank you, Marina. Thank you, panelists. Uh, we are coming to the now next and the last panel of this road to MRF. We just cleaned the, the the panel itself for uh, DG that is just coming in the room. Thank you.